often fall from my face in sorrow as I walk on through the long lonely night so often I cry but it seems no one hears me but then through the shadows I can see the dawning of light. Those shadows they thought my cross was heavy. Sometimes it seems that I'll never see another day dawning. But I remember his word. Though the night find me weeping, he's promised me surely there'll be joy in the morning. Now soon this old life with all of its heartaches will be left behind. There's a new day and on it, and the shadows of sin will vanish forever, and forever we'll find where the sun always shines, joy in the morning. The shadows may fall, my cross is heavy. Sometimes it seems that I'll never see another day down in. Then the shadows of sin will vanish forever. And forever we'll find where the sun always shines. Joy in the morning. Yes, he's promised me, and I know there'll be joy in the morning. Bethlehem Calvary, all of it tell. Oh, what a Savior 
is mine. Mountain and plain with his praises shall swell. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost, He's wonderful and glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine. There on the cross, where he died for my sin. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Giving his life a poor wonder to win. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Rising again in his infinite grace. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Shedding upon me the light of his face. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior, oh, what a Savior, oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost, He's wonderful and glorious, oh, what a Savior is mine. He's lifting my burdens, relieving all my care. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Giving me courage to do and to dare. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost, He's wonderful and glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost, He's wonderful and glorious. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Amen. The Savior is mine tonight. And uh, I can agree with that song on what a Savior is mine. I'd like to say it's good to be home. And uh, good to be back here uh, at the church and uh, thankful for what the Lord's doing and uh, has done uh, in recent days. And the Lord's still been good. And I want to thank the Lord for it. And it's good to be here tonight. And uh, uh, I can tell by the look on some of y'all's face, y'all are pretty nervous because y'all know I preach long a lot of times. And uh, so if you get in with it, I'll be done. I'll be finished in just a few minutes. So just get in with it. Don't, don't get in to get out. Get in to stay in it. So that's just how I feel about it. So anyway, Psalm chapter 100. Psalm 100. Very familiar portion of Scripture tonight. And uh, we'll read the whole chapter and bring you what the Lord's put on our heart. If my voice goes out, don't judge me. I've already got about an hour on my voice today anyway. So y'all pray for me tonight. And um, it's that time of year and uh, allergies and voice issues and all that good stuff. So y'all pray for me tonight and uh, pray that the Lord will get in it and uh, we'll be finished in just a minute. When you find your place in Psalm 100, let's stand for the reading of the Word of God tonight. And uh, like I said, we'll read all five verses here. And just maybe say a couple things and maybe try and be a help to you tonight. Psalm 100, verse number 1 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. 
All ye lands, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing, know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves, we are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. <clears throat> Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, and his mercy is in everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. I want to read verse number five again. The Bible said, For the Lord is good. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful blessings of God. <clears throat> thank you, Lord, for letting us be in church tonight. Lord, on a Sunday night, no place we'd rather be. There's a lot of places we could be tonight, but Lord, I thank you and I bless your name for letting us be in this place. Thank you, Lord, for health and strength that you've given us today. And I pray, Lord, that you'd fill us with your spirit. Allow us to communicate the word of God as easily as we can. May the Holy Spirit of God give power to the words that come out of my mouth tonight. Lord, I pray that you guard my lips. Lord, I pray that you use this vessel and meet for the master's use. God, help us tonight in a great way. And we'll thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. You can be seated tonight. When we come to Psalm 100, we often think about a psalm of praise, a psalm of thanksgiving to God. And uh, if we go a couple chapters back into Psalm 93, what we find uh, from Psalm 93 to Psalm 99, I believe some of the best psalms that exalt Christ. Brother, Brother Allen, I believe uh, from Psalm 93 to Psalm 99, Jesus is about 100 foot tall, about 50 foot wide, and he's, he's more exalted than he's ever been before. And when we come to Psalm 100, one man said it like this. I like what he said. He said it's almost as if Psalm 100 is the chorus to the cluster of psalms from Psalm 93 to Psalm 99. And I looked up with the chorus of a song. Uh, the importance of a chorus is that it has the responsibility of being a great climax or a great payoff in the song. I got to thinking about some songs that we sing a lot of times, and I don't think we sung any of these songs tonight, but number 279 in the church hymn, Lo, I Want to See Him. Verse number one said, As I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow, many arrows pierce my soul from without within, but my Lord leads me on, and through him I must win. And oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my voice. Cares all past home at last, never, ever to rejoice. And uh, if we look at this song, we can see that it talks about journeying through life, singing along the way as we go, trying to point people to Calvary. But when it gets to that chorus, it's the great climax of what we're going to see one day. Oh, I want to see him and look upon his face. Number 265 in the church hymn of love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Amen. And uh, we look at this and a picture of sin in verse number one of the song, but then this chorus of the great climax or the great payoff saying that love lifted me. Just one page over at the cross. I'm not going to read through all these songs tonight, but one of my favorite hymns is number 220, the love of God. And man, when you read this song, oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore enter the saints and angels' song. Number 188, he lives. When you think about this, I serve a risen Savior. He lives in the world today. The song goes on to say, he walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. The verses of these songs gives us a glad story, but this chorus gives us a, a glorious emphasis of what the whole song is talking about. 
And when we look at Psalm 100, you can read from Psalm 93 all the way over. And what you're going to find is when you get to Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. You go to Psalm 93, verse 1. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also established that it cannot be moved. Psalm 91 or 94, verse 1. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. Psalm 95, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Psalm 96, 1. O sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Psalm 97, 1. The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Psalm 98 verse 1. Oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. I'm glad for a day when I started singing a new song. Quit singing them old songs, started singing a new song. But he said, for he hath done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. Psalm 99 verse 1. The Lord reigneth, let the people trump tremble. He sitteth between the cherubs, let the earth be moved. Psalm 100 then tells us the great chorus of all these psalms make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye land. And as we look at this psalm, one man also said, I'm going somewhere with this for a second. I know it's kind of quiet, but I'll get to it in a second. One man said that this is the psalm of the church. He looked at this psalm, read it over and read it over and read it over, and he said he could not help but think of the pictures of why he loved the church. And that's what I want to preach on tonight, on why I love the church. On why I love the church. Look with me here in verse number one and verse number two. The Bible said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. I want to say first of all, number one reason why I love the church is the sounds that are found from within. The sounds that are found from within. Notice in verse number one, the Bible said, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye land. When we think about verse number one, I'm thankful for the noise of shouting. The noise of shouting. You may say, preacher, well, I don't shout. You need to start shouting. It's biblical. The Bible tells us all through Psalms and all through of the Gospels of all these people that when they got healed by the Lord Jesus Christ, they didn't say thank you, Lord, and just move on to the next go or go on to the next path in life. But the Bible said in Acts chapter number three, when that lame man laid there at the gate, the Bible said that he laid there all of his life, Brother Allen, what he did when, the, when Paul or when Peter and John walked past and healed him. What he did, the Bible said that he got up, his feet and his ankle bones received strength, and he went leaping and praising God. I'm simply saying to you this evening that the noise of shouting, Matthew chapter 10 verse 30 said, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. He said, fear you not, therefore... Ye are more value, you have more value than many sparrows. But then he changes the topic in verse 32. He said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. You may say, Preacher, well, I just don't know about all that. I don't want to uh, embarrass my flesh, and I don't want to do this, and I don't want to do that. I'll say to you, Brother Allen, it'd be good for a lot of Christians today just to step back and throw their flesh under the bus and just get a good dose of old-fashioned Holy Ghost worship and get in this thing not to get out. I'm saying to you, I, I remember uh, sitting there in the choir as a kid. I remember standing where Carson and Cole was standing tonight. And I remember watching Brother J.E. Glass and Miss Faye and Miss Modell. I remember watching them 90-year-olds and them 80-year-olds raise them old hands. They couldn't hold them still and they were just shaking and shaking and shaking and they just simply couldn't do it anymore. But I'll say I remember those times when they'd stand up, not in the power of the flesh, not in the power of man. Oh, but I'm telling you, friend, they'd stand up in the power of God and they'd begin to shout, begin to rejoice, begin to glorify God. You may say, preacher, well, I think it's just kind of showy. Well, you don't know your Bible. Every time Jesus healed a man of the blind, every time he healed somebody that was sick, he didn't go up to him and shake his hand 
hand and shake the preacher's hand and say, thank you, preacher, for what you preached this morning. That was, that was a blessing to him. You know what he did? He just got in the thing and he said, you know what? Forget all the people that's done all these things all my life. I'm going to get in this thing. I'm going to shout and I'm going to worship. Can I say to you this evening that I remember as a child watching all them old saints of God. Man, they begin to shout, begin to work. We need that in our day and hour. I'm tired of going to church when it's deader than a door nail at four o'clock. I'm tired of going to church where God ain't docked the doors in 25 years. I'm tired of that kind of church. We need to get back to getting relying on God in our church services today. You may say, preacher, what about all that running? I'll just hit that while I'm here. That man in Acts chapter number through it. He did not care what the Pharisees in the temple was going to say. He did not care what all them men would say, but I'll tell you what he did. He began to run and leap and shout and praise God. You know why? Because he had got full of the Holy Ghost and God had blessed his soul. Amen. You may say, preacher, why is shouting so important? I'll say this to you. Worship is the most important thing in churches today. We got to have our worship back. I'm telling you, friend, it's, it's something that's went out the back door. I mean, it's like a revolving door. Sometimes it's here. Sometimes it's not. You may say, preacher, well, you just don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand the problems that I face on a daily basis. I don't really care what problems you got going on in your life. We've all got them. Everybody want, everybody want a lot. The Bible said Elijah was a man subject to like passion as we are. If Elijah had problems, what makes you think you won't have problems. I'll just say this, we ought to shout through our problems. That's what Paul and Silas did. Acts chapter number 16, you know what they did? I mean, they're in a problem. The Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians 11 that Paul said, I received stripes above measure. He said, I received uh, five times, saved, uh, uh, received of the Jews five times, 40 stripes saved one. I mean, all through chapter 11, Paul said, perils of hunger, perils of thirst, perils of shipwreck. I mean, perils of everything. People left him, people forsook him. But you know what Paul did sitting in the prison cell? I say bless his name. He began to worship. He began to praise. You know why? Because something was living down on the inside of him that got bigger than him at times. I wonder about these people. They never smile. They act like their mother-in-law's moved in with them for all of eternity. And I'm simply saying to you, we've got to get back to the real thing. Yeah. Real thing. Yes, sir. Amen. Uh, amen. Noise of shouting. I'm going to go ahead and just hit some more while I'm here. You see, in all, all through the Bible, I mean, I can take you all through the Bible and show you instances of shout. Ezra chapter 3 is another one of them. They're laying the foundation of the temple. The Bible said them old men standing off to the side, them ancient men, them chief of the fathers, they're standing off to the side of the sea. And they're, they're, they begin to cry, they begin to weep, begin to shout. Them younger men that's laying that foundation, Ezra chapter 3, Brother Allen, they look back and say, what in the world y'all sobbing about? What in the world y'all crying about? Oh, no, just nothing. We're just out of 70 years worth of bondage. Oh, that, nothing, nothing to me. Major, Brother Allen, I believe them young men, all they've ever known is bondage. All they've ever known is being stuck in uh, Babylonian captivity. But them old men, they knew what it was like to be outside of bondage. And they knew what it was like to be in bondage. They knew what it was like to be on both sides of the tracks. And they looked at them young men. They said, if God's never been good to us again, we'd still have to shout from here to glory. We'd still have to shout. You know why? Because Jesus, or the, because God had done great things for us. Ezra chapter 9 goes on a little further. The Bible said Ezra's beseeching God. And what he does, Ezra, he begins to look around, sees the sins of the nation. And what, what Ezra did, he looked at the sins of the nation and he turned around and he said, well, we've got better than our iniquities deserve. I say to you tonight, I don't care if your bank account has a goose egg. I don't care if your car payment's coming due next or on tomorrow and you don't have the money left. If you, if you lost your shout, you need to find it back. If you threw it out the window on the way to church, you need to seek it when you go home. I'm saying to you tonight, I don't care what problem you've got. If he never done anything good for me ever, ever again in my life, Brother Allen, I'd still shout from here to glory. I say hallelujah. I say bless his name. I say glory to God. You know why? Because he saved me by the grace of God. Right. Amen. What was it? Psalm 107 said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I just want to say so. Is that all right? I just want to say so. I worry about churches that never raise a hand during singing. I worry about churches that sit there like a wooden Indian on Sunday morning. They ain't moved in the last 25 years. I wonder whether they, whether they got the real thing or not because I want to shout every time I think about being saved. I mean, God, God's blessed us beyond measure. He's met needs in my life. But I'll say to you, if he never done anything good for me again, I'd still have to shout to, shout to the glory that he still saved me. Amen. He saved me. 
Sounds from within, the noise of shouting. But not only that, verse number two deals with the noise of service. The Bible said, serve the Lord with gladness. Brother Allen, I've never seen a day in my life where people come to church and act like they don't even want to be there. I mean, they come in with a, well, they come in with a God, God help me if you can attitude. They, they come in with a lip pooched out, the thumbs hanging out of the front pockets, act like God ain't never loved them, act like God died, and act like everything's going wrong in their life. Can I say to you this evening, my service in a church is to preach the Word of God. That's, my, that's what God's called me to do. And if that offends you, it's just going to have to offend you. But uh, the noise should be heard of me is preaching. When people walk in a church, you know what they ought to hear? They ought to hear a man of God uh, preaching. Every, I mean, when people walk in the church, Everybody's got a service in the church. You may say, Preacher, what do you mean? I don't care if it's taking out a trash bag or flushing a toilet in the back. I don't care what it is. Service is very imperative in our churches today. The Bible says, Serve the Lord with gladness. I don't care if it's scrubbing a toilet or mowing the front yard. I don't really care what it is. It's all serving God. It's all serving. I believe those that have done all those things all, all through the years, I believe they're going to get a special reward come, come judgment day. I believe they'll get a special reward. Well, you did it with gladness. You did it, you did it because you love God. You didn't do it because people ask you to. You just did it. Right. Amen. I mean, at the fellowship dinners, Brother Steve, you know what we want to do? We want to sit there and fellowship and talk. And there ain't nothing wrong with fellowship. I love, I love fellowship. I love all that stuff. There ain't nothing wrong with any of that. But I say, if you want to serve God, go get you a trash bag. Go get you a broom somewhere. Go start sweeping up some crumbs. Go pull out some chairs. Go walk down some tables. You may say, Preacher, you mean to tell me that serving God? It sure is. Hey, right, sure. You may say, Preacher, why? Because not everybody can preach. Not everybody teaches Sunday school. Not everybody, not everybody will sing in the choir. I believe, I believe a lot of people should sing in the choir, but uh, even if they can't sing or not, I didn't sing the choir tonight because I ain't got hardly much of a voice. I knew I'd be, uh, y'all probably, man, he's a hypocrite and all this kind of I, I believe tonight. I believe it, brother Allen. I believe. It. I believe I ought to get in the choir and sing. You may say, "Preacher, well, I can't sing. I can't carry a tune in a bucket." I, I'll tell you something. I've been in services before where the best. I mean, the best singing group gets up. I mean, it's deader than four o'clock. I mean, it is absolutely dead, dead, dead. I mean, it's like it's like trying to put the graveyard on life support or something. But I've also been in other services where somebody gets up and says, they can't carry a tune in a bucket. They can't even carry the rhythm of the song. But I'm telling you, God drops in that place. You may say, preacher, why, why is that? Because a lot of times in singing groups, they're singing for a paycheck. Right. But then people that can't sing worth, worth, worth nothing, you know what they're singing for? They're singing because they love Jesus. Amen. Yep. Amen. Noise of service. But I'll say to you also in verse number two, the Bible said, come before his presence with singing. I want to say the noise is found from within, the noise of shouting, the noise of service, but the noise of singing. You see, when I come to church, I want to hear the saints of God sing. I don't like going, but see, I don't like going to church that don't ever get their people up in the choir. Amen. I, I like singing congregationals, but it, it really ain't the same. I mean, it simply really ain't the same. I've been in churches. I, I, I got to be careful here. <laughs> I've been in churches before, Brother Steve. They, they, I mean, they wouldn't even stand up in the choir. I mean, might as well cut the back half of the church off because I ain't going to get no choir. I mean, cut it off right behind the pulpit. I mean, ain't no use even having pews in the choir. I've actually been in a church where they didn't even have a choir. I mean, it was just a big open area behind the pulpit. <laughs> that don't make sense to me. You may say, preacher, well, why are you preaching on singing in the choir? Oh, I'm simply saying when God's people get up and start singing, I mean, when, I, when, when somebody's sitting out in the congregation, especially the pastor of the church, you, you may say, preacher, what do you mean? I'm simply saying the pastor of the church, when he's sitting on the front row, he likes to, get, he likes to watch his people worship. Right. Brother Alvin, when I was pastoring, I love to watch my people worship. I, I mean, even if it was just a smile on their face or an uplift hand, I mean, that, I mean, that put some gas in my tank, get me fired up again, ready to preach. That's right. Noise of singing. You see, when I, when I come to church, I, I expect to hear some singing. I understand the Lord leads sometimes. Maybe, maybe sometimes there ain't no singing. Maybe sometimes there ain't even no preaching. But I'll say to you, sometimes I love the noise of singing. Right. And that's another reason why I love the church. Amen. Notice with me secondly tonight, not only the noises or the, or the sounds found from within. Well, let, let me say this first. One man said this. This is, a, I think a rock singer said this one time. He said, it is said that music can change the world because it changes people. Is that not right? I mean, that's right. 
You listen to country music and rock music through the week, it, it's going to get you eventually. Right. That's a picture. It, it ain't affecting my attitude worth nothing. You better check up and look in the mirror on Sunday morning. Because it will affect your attitude and it will affect the way you live your Christian life. That's right. You say, preacher, but I, I, I don't drink like they do. And I, I don't, I'm not a womanizer like a lot of them men are. And all, all this kind of stuff. It don't matter. It's that influence. You're, you're putting stuff in. You're putting stuff into your body. You don't need to even be there. Well, when I come to church, Brother Steve, music, music changes the whole atmosphere of the service a lot of times. Brother Allen, I've been in some church, we, get, we come down to the altar for prayer, and man, it's dead. I mean, you can tell there's a spirit of, uh, uh, just a tight spirit in the church already. Man, they get up and start singing, you mean you feel it ease up a little bit. And then somebody starts singing a special song, lifting up Jesus. I'm telling you, songs need to get back to lifting up Jesus. I, I love songs about heaven, but I'm tired of listening to songs about heaven that don't ever mention Jesus. Amen. Amen. If that bothers you, it's going to have to bother you. Yeah. I'm tired of listening to songs. I'm going to see my granddaddy, my grandmama, and then I'm going to walk a little further, and I'm going to meet my brother and sister. It's went on. I don't care about that junk. I want to hear about Jesus. That's right. Jesus. <laughs> but I'll say this to you this evening. Second of all, not only the sounds found from within, but I want to say secondly, out of verse number three, the second reason I love the church is the Savior found from above. Look at verse number three. Bible said, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Amen. I'll say, first of all, the Bible said, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. I'll say, first of all, he masters us. He masters us. There's a, I mean, in our day and hour, people don't like authority. They don't like, the, I mean, even kids nowadays don't even like parents. I mean, they don't even like their parents. They have an authority over their lives telling them what to do. Right. But I'll say to you, a lot of church members don't like a pastor to tell them what to do and how to live their life. Right. They say, preacher, why? Because they've got lukewarm, they've got cold on God, and they don't want anybody telling them that they're wrong. Yes. Well, that's the church age we're living in today, the church of Lehigh to see. I mean, I could preach there for a long time, but I'm not. He masters us. You see, we can, come, we can come to church, but without him, I mean, it's all in vain. If, I mean, we can get up, we can open our Bible, we can give us a good, alliterated outline and all, all this kind of stuff. But if it ain't got the power of God on it, I don't care what he's got to say. Yes, sir. You may say, preacher, why? Because if the Lord is not the master over him, if he's doing it because he knows he's going to get a good love offering, I don't want anything to do with it. You're right. yes. Amen. Amen. The Savior found from above. If he's not mastering us, who is? Amen. Why don't we ask ourselves that question? If he's not the master of us, if he's, if he's not the leader in our church, who is? Amen. There's a lot of Baptists today, man, they control the thermostat in the church. If it's hot, they, they want it cold. If, it, if it's cold, they want it hot. They want it right in the middle. I'm telling you, I don't want middle ground. I want it hot, hot, hot. He masters us. He, he made us. The Bible said, it is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. Brother Steve, I, I hate this mentality that the world's got today. Man, I hate it. And I, I don't mean to blow everything out. I, I'm not trying to blow everything out. I'm, I, I don't know. I guess I, uh, a couple Wednesday nights ago, I blew it all out and it cost me pretty big. So I, uh, y'all can laugh. I mean, it's not, it's not going to hurt you to laugh. But uh, man, that was dead. My soul. But he made us. Brother, Brother, Brother Steve, I don't like this mentality. Of, we've got to love ourselves before we can ever love anybody else. That's hogwash out of the pits of hell. You ain't never going to love anybody else till you love Jesus. Yes, you're right. You, I mean, you, you can love yourself all you want to, but my Bible still says there's seven things God hates, and one of them was a proud look. That's right. That's exactly what that, I'm tired of that mentality in churches today. They, they walk in, act like church can start because they arrived. You just remember this, that we didn't make ourselves, but the God of heaven made us. And you ain't worth nothing, and you ain't nothing but dirt. That's all we are. I'm going to hunker down on this next one for a second. The Bible said we are his people and the sheep of his pastor. He's the, he masters us, he made us, but I'm glad he ministers to us. 
Hallelujah to God. I'm glad he ministers to us. Anybody ever been in a tight spot, felt like the devil backed you into a corner like you'd never get out of the situation that the devil had put in your life, Brother Stephen, and all of a sudden there's just a little still small voice. Just, just a little still small voice that begins to stir. Amen. You may say, preacher, what are you talking about? I'm talking about that little still small voice when a loved one died and you're standing there at the casket wondering how in the world you're going to make it without them. I'm talking about that time, or, uh, all the times when you get out of the pulpit and you feel like you flopped and you feel like you messed up and it feels like God just wraps you up in a gentle embrace and just pulls you up close into himself. I'm telling you, there's been times where this book has got me out of more jams than anything in this world. And I'm simply saying to you, when the Lord begins to deal with you and the Lord begins to work in you, I'm telling you, you it ought to make you want to shout ought to go back to that first point of the sounds that come from within when he ministers to us he always gets the job done Amen. Yes, sir. he'll always get the job done that the, those times when it felt like nothing good would ever come of the situation or the problem or the pain those times when it felt like you didn't know what to do and which way to turn a very imperative decision to make and you just didn't know what to do ain't somebody glad tonight for that still small voice in the deep thick dark where you do not know how to find God when you look like Job did to the right and to the left and straight ahead and behind and you cannot find him. But Job said that I will come forth as gold when he tries me in the fire. Job said I know that he knows the way that I take tonight. He knows it. He knows it tonight. He ministers to us. I want to say lastly tonight out of verse number four the Bible said Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. I'll say, uh, first of all, I, I love the church because of the sounds found from within. I love the church because the Savior found from above. But I love the church because the supplication found from without. I said, preacher, what do you mean? Look at verse number four. The Bible said, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Brother Allen, you know what that means? Let, let me ask this question. When you come to church, how do you come in? Because according to verse number four, we're, we're supposed to come in with thanksgiving. Yes, we're supposed to come in with gladness. Yeah. We're supposed to come in with a smile on our face and have joy in our soul. You see, you wonder why a lot of people don't want anything we've got simply because we always mope and whine and complain about every little thing that comes our way. But did you know that the Word of God gives us some principles, Brother Steve, that there's always a purpose behind every pain and every child we always go through? There's always a purpose for it. God's not going to let you walk through the fire, Brother Allen, and have nothing at the other end. That's not how God works. That's not how God works. Let me ask you this question. How do you, when you come to church, how do you come in? Do you come in with a bless me if you can attitude? Or do you come in, let's go to meeting. I, I like people when they come in, man, let's go to meeting. Let's get up and sing a verse of amazing grace and let's get this thing started. I like, people to know, I like people when they come to church that I know they've been with God. Yeah. Yes, sir. I mean, when they walk in the building, it's like the presence of the whole service changes. Oh, yep. I've always heard stories of them older men of God, Brother Steve. They'd walk into a camp meeting somewhere. Men like Ed Ballou and Edgar Thomas and all the men. Like, they'd walk in a camp meeting somewhere and people just start getting saved. I mean, left and right. Boom, boom. They didn't have to write, hit the right key on the piano. They didn't even have to open a John 3, 16 and give them a verse and a couple verses of just as I am. I mean, just them men of God. You know why? Because they had spent time with the God of heaven. Amen. So let me ask you a question again. How do you come in? As the procession of worshipers gets to the gate, they're already rejoicing. They're already singing. I, I've heard Papa tell me the story all the time about Maple Grove when they had that revival back in the 70s there with uh, Brother Lloyd Guffey. I, I remember you telling me that story. That, I mean, they come in the building shouting. Yep. I, mean, they, I mean, they didn't have to get up and sing a couple songs and get everybody pumped and primed and ready to go to meeting. I mean, when they stepped on the parking lot, stepped on the grounds of the church, they were already ready to go to meeting. I mean, they're already ready. You know, I said, Preacher, why can't we see that? Because nobody's ready to go to meeting anymore. Everybody comes in dragging on the last leg from a hard week. I'm saying, you ought to you just go to bed about 8.30 on, on Saturday night. Get ready to come to church on Sunday. Come back Sunday night. Come back Wednesday night. And just get in this thing. Yeah. Get in it. Amen. You know what the problem with the church of Laodicea was? Some wanted to get in and some wanted to get out. I'll say this to them. Get in or get out. I, I'm not in this thing, Brother Steve, to just come just for a few minutes and leave. 
I, I don't want to hear an hour and a half full of singing and ten minutes worth of preaching. That's right. Amen. Amen. I want to come to church with a man of God, I mean, busts hide and I mean, tears me a new one and encourages my heart to live a better Christian life. One man said like this, Brother Steve, he said, when the preacher steps on your toes and you don't like it, just move your feet. Everybody get bent up out of shape when the preacher touches something, just move your feet. If you don't like it, just move your feet. And he'll hit them again. You have to move them again. But I'll say not only how, how do we come in, but I also want to ask this question, how do you leave? <laughs> do you leave different than you came in? Do you leave blessed rather than burdened? I mean, I mean when, when the pastor goes home, does he have to lay awake at night and wonder if you got a special blessing because he knows you're going through a hard time? How do you leave? When you come to church, how do you come in? But also, when you come to church, how do you leave? Are you the first one to hit the back door before the preacher can even get back there? Because I can tell you right now, that ain't right. I mean, that, that ain't right. See, a church that, I said it this morning when I was preaching, I said a church that's ununified is a church that's broken. And that's right. A church that's not unified one with another and love one another. I, I, I'm tired of the cliques and I'm tired of the uh, people that get in a group every night. Just get, go find the person that nobody likes and go talk to them. Amen. You might say, preacher, but all my friends, I don't, care, I don't care if every friend you've ever got in your life goes to the same church. Go find the person that nobody ever talks to, nobody ever spends any time trying to talk with. Talk to them. Amen. Yes, sir. That's what I had to do as a pastor. I mean, I had to go to those people nobody liked talking to. Those people, I mean, they're just on and on. And I, to be honest, I mean, it's hard to talk to them at times. But show them that you care about them. Amen. Yes. There's a lot of people in our churches today, they don't feel like they're even, they don't, I mean, they don't even feel like they're welcome in churches anymore. Man, I, I'm telling you, I, I, when I was pastoring, I'll say this and I'll be finished in just a second. There was a lady called me one time and uh, we were having a Saturday night thing there at the church and uh, kind of having like a little disciple, discipleship class. We were trying to teach, teach the church some things. And... Uh, I taught two 45-minute lessons on two different subjects there that night. And my phone, every night we done it, my phone was blowing up. I mean, text messages, phone calls, missed calls, voicemails, you name it. I, I mean, I had it on my phone. And I had a voicemail from this number. It was, it was a local number. So I was like, well, I, I probably ought to listen to this. You know, most of the time it's a scam number, wanting me to sell car insurance or something. But, uh, but this woman, she was talking now she was uh, she uh, she left a voicemail and I listened to it and uh, she was saying how uh, she's been looking for a church for a long time and uh, uh, would like was wondering if she would maybe be able to come to the service and all that sort of stuff. So then I well my goodness y'all can laugh it's all right it ain't gonna hurt you it's, just, it's not a sin to grin but this lady I, I called her back and I, I was talking with her and she told me. But see, this is what she told me. God, God bearing witness. I'll stand in the judgment seat for what she said. This is what she said. She said, I've been kicked out of three different churches because I wear a mask. I don't care if you wear a mask or not. I mean, be my guest. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not getting into that. that. It's not my business. It makes you feel more comfortable wear 13 of them. Wear gloves. I mean, that ain't my business. That, that's between you and God. I'll wear one. I, I'm not going to refuse service or anything like that because I won't put one on. Or but anyway, I'm detouring way off topic right there. That's a whole other message for another time. But I was talking to this lady and I said, well, I said, I don't care if you wear 13 of them and wear 14 pairs of gloves when you come and wear a hazmat suit for all I care. I said, if you want to come to church, come to church. I'm not. I'm not going to send you. I'm not going to boot you out because you, uh, because you're scared and because you're fearful of that. I ain't going to boot you out for something like that. That's foolish. Amen. She can't. I mean, she was. I mean, she's fired up, man. She. I mean, I, I tell on the phone, man. She's jumping up and down. She. They're already in the closet picking out what they're going to wear Sunday morning. And I talked, they got there, and man, she met me at the back door, man. She liked to maul me and tackle. I mean, she was excited about being at church. I preached, I don't remember what I preached on. She's like, man, that's, a, that's awesome. That's the best thing I've ever heard in my life. But you know what it was? It was somebody that showed compassion to her. That's somebody that showed her, hey, we care. Yes, we care. That's how every Christian ought to be. Hey, we care. Yes, hey, you're going through all time. We care. Right. 
We care. You may say, preacher, why rejoice? Why sing? Why do all these things? Verse number five tells us why. For the Lord is good. Amen. You may say, preacher, that, that's not, I thought you were going to say some kind of deep thought. No. For God, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endureth to all generations. Yes, sir. You may say, preacher, why do you love the church? Sounds from within. Savior from above, the supplication from I, I mean, there's more reasons we could go through. That's just all that's in Psalm 100 about that. But I'll say to you, why don't you love the church tonight? God's people's done more for me than any ball team's ever done for me. Amen. Yes, you must say, preacher, I, I don't like that. I love the Georgia Bulldogs and I, I love the Atlanta Braves, but they, if they lose every game now that Jesus comes, I'm not going to have to take a baby aspirin to go to sleep at night. Right. I'm just not. I, I love the Atlanta Braves, Brother David, but, I mean, Austin Riley can break Hank Aaron's record for the most home runs in a career. I mean, it ain't going to bother me if he don't. If Max Freed breaks Nolan's right, Nolan Ryan's strikeout record, I don't care. You may say, preacher, why? Because Jesus has done far more for me than a couple strikeouts in a nine-inning game or a couple home runs every other game. Jesus has done it all for me. Amen. You may say, preacher, why do you love the church? This is where Jesus is. What if, what, you may say, preacher, what if I watch it online? It's just not the same. You, you can't convince me otherwise. It's not the same. You can watch it online, but I, I was talking to a preacher the other day. Brother Steve, this is what he told me. He said they stopped. He, he runs a camp meeting up in North Carolina. He said we stopped live streaming our services simply because if you're there, you're just going to have to miss it. When you miss church, you may miss the greatest blessing that you ever, ever could have gotten. But you miss church. Reasons why I love the church. You may say, preacher, I just, I don't know about all that. If you don't love the church, you need to fall head over heels in love with the church. Every head by every eye closed. And the Papa.